Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I have become one of the more powerful nerds in all of Dota. I am 3K. I am Day9! And welcome to Day9 Learns Dota. We got Coach Purge. How's it going, Kevin? Pretty good. That was more than six seconds, though. Is that, is that bad for <laughs> yes. the mod people that don't understand that joke? <laughs> yeah, that was more than six seconds, said Kevin to Sean, with no context on the internet. You made a big yeah, mistake there, uh, Kevin. I did the countdown. It's uh, It was a lot more than six. Um, anyways, 3K MMR. Proud of you, man. Good job. That's uh, what seven fifty you've raised now. Uh, I started at uh, l just under um, twenty two hundred. I was twenty one eighty five is what okay. I started things off at, and so now I'm three thousand and sixteen. Helped in large part by the double down feature in the new battle pass. So did, you, did you actually win your game? Or I, I like I had a cheap double down the other day. I started my game, and somebody teleported instantly into our base to feed. So I instantly doubled down. I was like, oh, yeah, baby. 50 free MMR. It was super well, worth it. Uh, I'm going to load up Dota and take a look at that so I can actually give you a definitive answer. But for any of you who are joining us, this is the show where Kevin, the uh, the pretty much the it educator in the Dota world, who does nothing but make it comments and it thoughtful statements about Dota, teaches me one of the clowniest people who has ever lived. Um, but, but I am a clowny tryhard. And we've been enjoying ourselves, learning the Dota. And today's lesson, Kevin, what is it that we're going to be going over? Well, uh, originally when I wrote the lesson title, I was like, oh, we'll do going high ground, ending the game, things like that. But um, we quickly realized that just simply going high ground is already like a crap load of data and information. Oh, so okay. mostly we're just going to cover going high ground today. Um, and uh, it looks very simple, only three topics, but uh, times to go high ground, good and bad positioning, and where to stand, and lots of factors that, that go into that, because there's obviously so many situations in Dota that um, you have to keep in mind when you actually do try to go high ground. And for those of you guys that aren't super familiar with Dota, um, going high ground is basically uh, walking up the cliff into the enemy's base in the purpose of taking the racks, because that gives you a really big gold advantage, and tactical advantage, because then your creeps are stronger in that lane. Yeah, and so. I, mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about my experience of going high ground because I, I think that it it is representative of the wall of I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to do in this game anymore. Um, I yeah. think that when we started the series, my, my broad opinion was I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, I now feel like I know more and I feel like I have a better sense of, okay, I'm trying to push this tower in mid first. Okay, we did that. It looks like top could use some help. Let's help them push mid tower. Oh, we want to fight up in that top jungle. Let's push the tier two. There's a whole lot of if thens that. Uh, I mean, even though there's a lot of them, they're each individually quite clear. Go yep. for a gank here, push this tower there, and so on until you get to high ground. And I think that the things that I feel when I hit high ground are, the enemy team is all cloistered together, so it's very hard to get pickoffs. Yep. Before you get to high ground, it's very easy. Everyone's spread out in lanes. They're relying on the safety of their tower to be as greedy with gold collection as possible. And if you pick off one or two people, okay, it's five on three. Obviously, we just push and take an objective. How the mm -hmm. hell do you do that if everyone's hiding up on high ground? There's a couple yeah. heroes that I really, really hate playing against on high ground. Sniper. Okay. Yeah, I can never break a fucking sniper! He's like, he literally is sitting in the fountain, auto-attacking like yeah. a dick and uh zeus very difficult to break just insane range on the q ability um yeah. uh, there's just a couple of generally the aoe ish ones lena i also have trouble against but often i am playing as lena oh, 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 that's oh, one oh. way to counter her prevent she's on the enemy team just pick yeah, her yourself that's my build order so yeah i i have felt kind of stonewalled there and as we've seen me historically i just kind of tend to farm so um, okay any technique to get over that wall, literally. Well, we'll, we'll cover basics Perfect. at least um, and right. talk about the mostly the positioning stuff today. Um, like you said, getting two kills and then pushing high ground is, is ideal because ultimately you could do a five versus three, which gives you a higher chance of winning the fight. Because ultimately to kill buildings, your opponents have to not be there or you have to have creeps hitting the building in addition to you tanking the tower hits. Because if, uh, if it's five enemy heroes and they have a tower... That's like six euros kind of damage output wise. Yeah, so yeah. Um, killing them first is really beneficial. Attacking the tower when they're not there can be helpful. But all that stuff is a little bit more advanced. So we'll just talk about the basics of, let's say they have five years alive, you have five years alive, and you're going high ground. Yes. Um, ultimately, the uh, one of the most important things, um, just killing the building, um, is having creeps there. Uh, if you want to play clip 1A, we can look at the overall HP Ooh, of the melee barracks, the range barracks, and the tower. So this you know is what, for... Kevin? What's up? 
I've been I've been one handing this with coffee, but don't okay. worry. We're getting it open. We're getting it. We're going to clip one. We're scrolling up. Is it clip one B? One A actually. Believe it or not, we we're not crazy enough to make a clip one A B without a clip one A. Kevin. So, sometimes I, we skip main numbers, but I, never I, one. I don't I don't have a clip one A. Really? I don't it's, uh, have it. It's an image, if that helps. Oh my I think god. It's a PNG. I don't, I don't have. Oh my god, wait a minute. Wait, everybody, calm down. Everybody needs to calm down. I found it. I found the clip. Oh god, oh, 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 the tension of having something almost go wrong on air, but don't worry, Kevin, we played it off cool. I managed to find this video. Is it downloaded already, or did you forget to download that one? It was literally downloaded. I didn't see it because it was a PNG. Boom, there it yeah, is. Yeah. Oh, 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 dude, okay. the stakes are high in episode 11. Can't mess up now, right? It would break all of the uh, the new viewership that we get. <laughs> at, at week, we're pretty much like week 16 or something, but episode 11. Okay, so these are the armor levels, the HP, and the region of the three buildings that you're talking about. There's one set of these in each lane. Um, the the most important thing um, is the the relative armor levels, most likely. Uh, the the tier three towers have tons of armor. They have more armor if you have more heroes nearby. So the armor that the tower can get can be pretty ridiculous. Um, and just um, to make sure I'm understanding these numbers, when it says armor, for instance, on this uh, melee barracks, it says 15, parentheses, 47%. That's 47% physical damage resistance, right? Yes, 40% of all damage thrown at it is blocked. Also, they have fortified armor, which means that hero damage to fortified buildings already do 50%. So really, you're doing more like 25% of the damage your hero says that they're doing to those buildings. Right. It's very low. And that's assuming that they aren't buffed by like which is uh, ice armor or something like that instead. So um, yeah. once you kill the tower, then you can hit the barracks. Uh, the range barracks is easier to kill because it has less armor, it has less HP, and it doesn't have any regen. So you can chip that one down easier. So that's uh, the, the absolute basics about these. There's also something called backdoor protection, if you want to play clip 1B. Yes, I... I, I... <laughs> Put your glasses on for the first six seconds because it's very blurry. I don't know why, but uh, um... but after six seconds... It's all good. All right. Well, there we go. Okay, cool. You, you skipped already. All right. If you yeah, want to just pause here for a second. Yeah. So what this giant uh, barrier is, is the backdoor protection. The way that this works is, um, uh, oops, I'm sorry, my clip's playing, so I got confused. Um, the way that it works is um, if you try to attack those towers when there's no creeps near the enemy base, they have um, a whole lot of region, and I believe they also have some damage reduction. So, because back in Dota 1, there was this, like, moral rule where you're not supposed to backdoor towers because it was seen as, like, a dick move to, like, go somewhere where heroes weren't to kill a tower when there's no creeps there. Um, very good strategy if you're playing, like, Clinks or TA sometimes with a Desolator. Um, but the way they protect against it is there has to be creeps from your side there. Wait, it literally was, a, like, an honor thing? Like, just don't do this? Yeah, it was, like, the, the thing that people would flame in pub. It's, it's like, don't rush. You're like, it's like yeah, the moral. Yeah. You're, you're not supposed to rush, jerk. Like, you're being and an asshole right now. The most amazing thing ever is that in big game hunters games in Brood War, that code of honor is still pretty sturdy. Because I really huh. like playing free-for-alls and 2v2v2v2s, and everyone's like, no, dude, you're just not you're not supposed to attack. Like, why would you why would you attack early? There's no official time limit. It's just like, wait, you... Wait, what would you four pull me for? What are you doing? What's what you going on, man? Yep, it, um, it was, it, but it was a long time ago, and the game got patched and, and changed in a way that it doesn't really matter. The only towers that can be backdoored at all times are tier ones. Doesn't matter if there's creeps nearby; you can always kill those. So if you're losing a game late game really? and you get a lot of physical damage, you can just show up by a tier one and kill it really quick. Obviously, there's glyphs that'll make it invulnerable for six seconds, but that's a five minute cooldown, so huh. you don't necessarily want to use that. If I thought you, it was every protection. single tower had backdoor protection. I didn't it realize. got changed, I believe, um, but at least for quite a while, tier one towers have never had backdoor protection. Tier twos do have it; they have an individual AOE of, I believe, 900. But in this image, this big AOE is a base wide one. That means if there's a creep within this AOE at all, oh. all of the buildings in the base no longer have backdoor protection for 15.5 seconds. Okay, so like, oh shit, oh fuck, I did not know that this is how it worked. Because, I mean, as someone, okay, here, here's one of my favorite things about Dota, is that for all the complexity to it, you don't, you need to know hardly anything <laughs> yep. to play the game. And I would just see the shield and the regen, and vaguely, uh, eventually, someone told me, okay, no, it's, if there's creeps nearby, and I could not figure out how the main base worked at all. Yeah, well, I thought that works. there were creeps here that would be 
within range enough of these buildings. Sometimes yeah. all the creeps would be dead and we'd be attacking. I had no idea it was a 15 and a half second delay, yep. man. That it's it's a it's a base wide thing. So that means if the creeps enter that AoE, but your opponents kill them or the tower kills them, then after 15 and a half seconds, the the regional go back. And we have a clip Holy of this if you just want to continue this one. Oh, okay. Well, well, God, that sounds like the play to do. Someday it'll come through. So you probably pause like, wow. right away. Or had you pause right away. You'll get an animation. Oh, there comes three seconds. Oh. Here we come. All right. Oh. Okay, so this is a game uh, from Kiv Major. This is OG versus EG. So if you watch the creeps, there's no backdoor right now. Yeah. See that? Like, um, all, the, all the creeps have just died. And, the, and the, the thing we're looking for is next to the health bars, there should be a little green shield, basically. So all the creeps are dead, which means that the timer has begun. Because if you look around on the other parts yeah. of the map, now um, the easiest way to see the backdoor kicking back in, because it's been 15 seconds, is to keep an eye on the barracks. Once the tower dies, at some point the backdoor will kick in. Very briefly, right there, I believe. Yep, there it is. There's and then it goes protection. away again. And if because you want to pause right there, yeah. yeah, the creep wave on the bot lane got close enough, so the backdoor gets removed again. Wow. Yeah, let me actually try to pull back to the very moment where... There's the pause. Yeah, you can see the little green shield right uh, hmm. above my mouse cursor. So any damage done to those during backdoor will eventually get healed to full. It heals very fast. Hypothetically, they could auto-attack it down to 20% if they had enough damage. But if you glyph it right there, then for those five seconds, it's still regening at the same rate back to the original health total. So one of the most important things about pushing is that you actually have a creep wave with you because you need to be able to disable backdoor protection. Otherwise, you'd have a bunch of stupid games where somebody picks IO Tiny every game and just teleports in the enemy base and wins the game when you're out of position. And now this also makes sense so much as to why pushing all the lanes, or like another benefit of having all the lanes pushed, is that in this circumstance, backdoor protection goes up, but it goes down because bottom lane is pushed, yeah. not because there's another creep wave here. Because I've wound up in the situation where the top and bottom lanes are way back. But our mid lane is pushed super far forward, and we have to just play. Um, you have to play that lane. You have no other choice, basically, play, right? Play, play dither game. <laughs> so at that point, it kind of becomes a game of can we get our creeps into the base and keep them alive for a while? And the yeah, best yeah. way to do that is you can buy items like pipe to give them magic barrier. You can use a mech to heal them up. A Vlad's helps gives them armor and uh, HP and or damage Jesus, and stuff like that. Ever to me. Holy but shit, most of that man. stuff is like older in Dota. People don't really prioritize the creep wave as much as they used to because they're just yeah. good at pushing other wa la waves. Um, and most heroes, most players are very good at like picking heroes that are that can spam out waves. Um, but another solution that you could do, if EG, for example, wanted to, what they could do, if none of the other lanes were pushed, like in your example where it's only one lane, if one person just crosses the map, like let's say they're farming dire jungle, they can pop out by enemy mid racks when the creeps spawn and just kill them there. And that means that at some point, the creeps will not make it to the mid lane. And if they just defend like two waves, they've got backdoor protection. So there's like other little ways that you can play around this backdoor thing to completely shut down oh, a push attempt at all. I see what you mean. Oh my god, yeah. So that's, yeah, because that happened several times in the Kiev Major, where there'd be this huge push coming in, and there'd be some character cross map standing in the middle of, the, of a wave, clearing it off. Yep. And if this were a pub, that person would become the target of getting yelled at. Um, yeah, exactly. But okay. if they can defend that one creep wave or whatever's left on the map, then buys them 30 seconds, 45 seconds, which could be enough for their heroes to respawn. So lots of things like that to keep in mind. Interesting. But uh, that, is, that is certainly a small part of the episode. <laughs> but that's uh, nice. the, the, base, the base aspect and some interesting. Say, well, that's our show, everyone. That's we the hope show. You enjoyed it, yeah. Don't, 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 uh, make sure your towers don't get backdoored or whatever. Or, but you, they have to backdoor it. Okay, so other ways that you do want to go high ground. Enemy hero's dead. You have a large golden experience advantage because that gives you a better chance to win the fight. And um, if you have an Aegis, that's really good to have as well because it's like an extra life. Yeah, that's, uh, like that's I extra... think, the, the most clear way for me to push high ground as someone yeah. who knows no techniques. You just get the sixth hero. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely an easy way to do it. You still have to kind of force your opponents to go on you as that hero, though. Because if you don't do it the right way, if you sit in the back with Sniper or with the Aegis, and they just kill everybody else on your team, it doesn't matter. Because then you're in a 1v5, and then you yeah. respawn, and you're 1v5 again, so you die. Um, and the other one that is oftentimes overlooked, I think, in pubs, is that if your opponents have used their teamfight ultimates that are long cooldown, like Ravage, Black Hole, Global Silence, stuff like that. If they've used it, you, they've yeah. got two minutes until they're going to be at full fighting capacity. So exploiting those things are the other simple things you can do to say, I think we're going to be able to win a fight and therefore take the racks afterwards. And if you take the racks... It makes your creep stronger, which means that lane always pushes. Even if you don't go there, it's pretty much always pushing. And that gives you a better chance of not having to worry about backdoor. So just huge advantages by Rexing. It's the, the best way to like start winning a game um, in terms of the tactical advantage of killing the enemy throne. 
So, all right. So with that said, that's that's like some some absolute basics. Let's talk about positioning. Got um, it. I, what's what's your current understanding of position positioning? Ooh, well, uh, I have done tons of exploration of places to die. Uh, I've, I've okay. had extensive experience in getting caught out of position. But um, when you say positioning, do you mean generally on the map or in regards to high grounds? Uh, both, really. Like, uh, what's your definition of, of bad positioning or good positioning? So, okay. I, I, so, uh, this was hard for me to answer when I wrote the guide as well, so I thought I wanted to give you a shot at it. Okay. I'm going to vomit a pile of thoughts upon you. Okay. And it's up to you to sort through them to find merit. All right, I'm good at that. Okay, I can do so, it. Um, for me, it's the idea of having, like, so there's their team and our team, and here's the blobs, generally okay. speaking, and you want the, the sort of pr proper arrangement of, like, weak, squishy supports carefully in the back, the people who are good at absorbing hits or being poked at at the front. Mm -hmm. um, but... That's just generally speaking, I get that because I've been the lion in the front who gets killed and then the team fight starts and I have red cheeks. Um, yeah. the, the things that I've consistently struggled with that a lot of people saw when I was playing as Slark last week and all the support games I played is that with ganks, it's really fun to come from the side. So it's me against one other person and my buddy in lane. So we two on one them and kill them. I don't know how to come at a side angle properly because typically when I try to do that, any team fight that I engage, no matter who I am, it's a great way to get my ass killed. So okay. th this is about it. I try to stay safely far back, but I, as a person, I tend to be a little over aggressive. Yeah. Um, you kind of covered like aspects of going high ground, but ultimately the uh, like good positioning keeps you safe, basically. It prevents your opponents from punishing you or being able to initiate in a favorable way, and bad positioning gives them that capability to do. And then it comes down to the player knowledge. Do the players Man, know that you're out of position, and are they able to recognize it? And do they have the vision to be able to recognize it? And then, a clean statement. will they actually do it? And that's basically your average pub. It's knowing, like, the better players know when their opponents are out of position before the opponents know that they're out of position. And then they will punish them for it. So it's like, oh, you're making a mistake, they kill you. I'm sure that happens to you all the time. You'll be like, wow, I thought I was safe there, but then I just get instantly killed. You'll... All the time, yeah. And, and that happens enough where you just kind of start figuring out what's possible, what you can get away with. Uh, very very similar as doing build orders and practicing them, really. Yeah, just I mean, uh, more painful, maybe. Okay, so so fast question about positioning. That, that, see, that's a very nice guiding statement. You need to ask what are the ways that they can disrupt and screw me up, and therefore... Where do I stand to avoid that? Because there's obviously solutions in terms of items, like what item would I buy to respond to Zeus's magic damage. But positioning yeah. is saying, ignore the fact that you have any items right now. Where should you stand? Okay, now that you have magic immunity, how does that change where you get to stand? Yeah. Um, and, and basically yeah. it comes down to the, if you're, if you're talking about 5v5s, what you should be doing is, ideally you are not by yourself versus five enemy heroes. Like if you're in, within cast range of five enemy heroes, and your team has four behind you that aren't in cast range of their five heroes, then it's kind of a bad thing because that gives them at least fractions of a second where they can focus on you together. So if you think of like five ranged heroes with the same range and five enemy heroes with the same range, it's best if you're all attacking at the same time. You don't like fight one Marine versus five Marines, right? You want to attack at the same time, have more people right. attacking, therefore your your mass will win first. Yeah. So that's kind of how you have to think about it as well. So it kind of comes down to ganking, it comes down to positioning. But with that said, not every Marine is the same, um, is, is the case in Dodo, obviously, because every hero is very different. So yeah. that's that's the the simple way to talk about it. But it's obviously very, so complicated that it's kind of difficult to break it down simply. True. But um, uh, let's go over some of those advantages. Uh, one of the biggest advantages in Dota, out of all of them, is uh, certainly initiation advantages. That is the biggest thing. Whichever person goes in first has a reflex advantage, communication advantage, all of that stuff. You can stun before people use BKBs, for example. All that stuff uh, makes a big difference. So why don't you play clip number three for me? You got it. Oh, clip three, not clip two? Uh, I, just, I decided to skip number two. You got it, man. Let's do clip three. Woo! Woo! Okay, actually, I, I'm I'm sorry. Let's go back to two. Two is too good to pass up. Two we got it. We got to play. Oh, dude, we got it. We got to do clip two, play. dude. It's actually a, a clip from your game. So this is your really? team here. You guys got an Aegis. You're like, hey. Wait, wait. Which one am ground. I? You are the Crystal Maiden. Oh, sick. Team, your team wants to go high ground. You're ready to go. And then uh, your guy over here just got completely oh, killed. Oh, I fucking remember this game. Yeah. 
Because he's by himself. So naturally, um, turtle. because you have a dead hero, now it's kind of hard for you guys to go high ground. And here you are on Crystal Maiden. Oh. Um, would you say that you're out of position here? Yeah. But that tower did die a little bit faster because that was 29 damage just now. Yeah, I know. I'm pretty, pretty, I'm pretty sick. See, and like, after after that danger, you went back and did it again. Is this was this the one of the games from my big losing streak with? Uh... I have no idea where. You, I don't. I don't know where you got it. From. There it is, man. No, it's okay. I'm trading because this tower is not going to regenerate as well as I am. And that's why you got like... tranquils, right? I know. That's exactly right. Woo! All right, we can move on. I'll clip through. I just have to show that. <laughs> San Sander You're found a that one. Don't look at me. Oh. The Sander found that clip. That, oh I am, my I'm god! I'm yeah, we, oh, you were this close to letting that one sweep under the rug. Yeah. Then I thought of you hitting the towers the second time, and I was like, nah. No, we, we have to. We have that. to shame. So in this example, this is a IG versus newbie game. Um, we just missed a moment. If you want to go back and play one more time, the initiation. I this game, yeah. So what happened is Sand King has an instant cast ability, which yeah. prevents the Juggernaut from spinning and becoming magic immune. So he instantly disables the jug, and they follow it up with a skewer that Rubik stole from the Magnus, which allows them to push the the uh, jug completely out of position. So despite him having the Aegis, they kill him instantly under the tier fours, and now when he respawns, he's got even further to run back to safety. So this is the the initiation advantage. It's the same thing with like a tide under blinking and ravaging the enemy team. If they don't see it coming, and they'll get stunned before they pop their BKBs, then the, your whole team has like what three seconds to initiate and do damage and cast follow up spells. Wow. Like the yeah. initiation advantage is ungodly powerful in Dota 2. It means so much, and a lot of that is based on vision, obviously. But that's what happens when you go to push a high ground. Your opponents know you're coming because your tower can see them, or your creeps can see them. Therefore, the initiation advantage is almost always on the de defensive side. It's one of the big advantages that you have um, when you're defending people going high ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, delays the power curve, stuff like that. If somebody dies in the burst, you get a 5v4 due to the initiation advantage. So that's huge. Um, vision advantage to start the fight quickly is, is really big, like I said. Clip number four, if you want to play that one. Yeah. So this is a game from EG versus OG. Now, if you take a look at where... Um, EG is positioned here. Uh, Magnus on the left side is invis. He got a shadow blade, and he's basically waiting to see until OG groups up heavily to end up getting a kill, if possible. Because yeah. uh, if they group, you know, uh, more advantage. But he ends up getting spotted here by the Trium Protector, and he ends up getting killed as a result. So that's simple vision advantage. The place that Jerex was standing there, if you press play, he's actually to the bottom left a little bit, right south of the line. You'll see the blink animation in like two seconds here. Um, where he's basically like next to the Magnus picture on the bottom of the screen, but he's invis standing next to a tree. So he's over there with the gem, mm -hmm. and any yeah. second, as soon as he blinks in, you'll see the blink animation. You'll know where he was actually standing. Oh, that right yeah. there, see where it was? That's where he was standing, but because he had the gem there, he spots the Magnus, which allows him to go in. That vision advantage means that he does damage to Magnus, which prevents Magnus' blink dagger for three seconds, and it pretty much guarantees that he can't get, can't get an RP off. And because he dies here, he's forced to buy back, which buys them also more time to hit the building. So a little bit of vision yeah. advantage like completely changes your ability to high ground. Um, so vision is absolutely huge. There's other tricks you can do. You can yeah. place a ward over there by where your universe is standing. I'm sure people have done that in your games as well. Yes. Let's you see where your opponents are. Let's you initiate on them. Uh, helps you defend against them, initiate on you. All that stuff is is uh, a big advantage when you're trying to take high ground. So it, it, if I can attempt to piece this together, if we are pushing up to the tower... If our opponents are being very passive, we're going to just be able to chip away at the tower and eventually break. Yep. So what teams will tend to do is to find ways to be on the flanks, like where Universe is in, in this screenshot, in order to get that initiation advantage. Yep, I do. Therefore, if you get vision in order to see it, you can pick people off who are doing this and mm -hmm. who are maybe out of position or maybe are surprised and this is the way to get the pickoffs that you need to get like the 4v5 or 3v5 situation. Yep, exactly, because OG doesn't want to just roll up the hill and try to kill their opponents because it's kind of dangerous based on the map and AoE and things like that. Um, so it's pretty much a slowly chip away with the heroes that do a lot of damage to the tower, which is Terrorblade, um, and then yeah. eventually find a position where they can initiate or eventually the tower dies. If the tower dies, then... Your opponents don't have true sight anymore, so your invis works better. Yeah, They have less vision because they don't have this forward building that spots enemies. They don't have 
um, the tower damage as well, which is very useful because if you run in there attacking a hero, the tower aggroes you. It's the same way that aggro works. And then all of a sudden the tower, instead of hitting creeps, will hit your hero, so which gives you a better chance to, to actually defend right. correctly. So it's so all those advantages. Uh, you can also get them under shrine, things like that. That way you have shrine regen, your tower's attacking, and you can respawn, and you can buy back TP, and there's so many defensive advantages that are huge. Um, uh, another big advantage that you can have is uh, initiation range, if you want to play clip number five. Boom. So this is uh, an example. This is game one, I believe, where Secret stomped the crap out of SG Esports. God, that game was not close. I watched that live and was like, yeesh, I guess I'll go to bed. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely what it looked like. Um, but just by having the mobility that Ember Spirit does, he's able to disable the guy in the back line. So the, the really cool part about this clip is I want you to replay it from the start and check the vision that they had. So they go high ground. The reason they pass the creep wave is because Ember's looking for heroes because he wants to prevent them from initiating. They want to see if they can disable them to allow their heroes that do do good damage to just hit the tower. Because there's two dead heroes. They're not going to take a 5v5. They can be a little aggressive here. Yeah. And uh, go back one more time. Uh, basically, we'll see where the Kunk is standing right now. How did they get vision there? Uh, is it this giant golem that's giving it's, vision? It's, it's the golem. I had no idea that his night vision was this big. But it's godly huge. Start the clip over again and, and watch watch the difference here when he goes Ooh, high ground. I actually, I I thought that it couldn't that possibly beginning? be that. Look at this. Holy See, because the heroes shit. are walking forward and they're Holy looking for heroes. Look at his vision. What the fuck? It's like an observer ward, right? And if you look at how Kunkka plays this, he doesn't think that he's in vision because the creeps over there. He assumes that ah, maybe it's like 800, 900, oh, 1000 something. Oh my he walks god. Forward. He's like, oh, I'm gonna cast some spells. This will be totally cool. And instantly Ember sees him. Gets max range disable, and now he's dead, which was kind of cool. So it's a, a mixture of vision, initiation advantages, things like that. And now they killed him. Now, he, now their team actually can't team fight 5v5 for 35 seconds instead of the 14. So actually defending high ground sometimes can be a little what complicated. What the fuck? I had no idea that guy had such insane... Well, holy shit. I mean, like... I I feel like the point of this video is not look at how long the vision range of the golem is. It's, it's not. I just had to focus on it. Yeah. It was it was too yeah. cool not to. Kunko was in a position where he thought he wasn't seen, which is what got him killed. And because Excuse there me. was high mobility on the dire side, they're able to punish that even better. Because if one side has more mobility, that means if you are out of position, they can instantly just collapse on you. So if you ever play against a team that has like four blink daggers, shift feels scary because if you don't win the team fight, they will chase you down no matter what. Like there's no getting away basically. So those kinds of things um, definitely affect no. how, how, how you do go high ground. Okay, so let's get to the meat of the episode. Where to actually stand. Um, the, the most base, basic aspect of this is AOE theory. Like if you have a single target spell, it's doing that much damage no matter what. But if you have an AOE spell yeah. and it hits five heroes, then all of a sudden your Crystal Maiden Freezing Nova that does 250 actually does 1250 damage, which is more than Alina Exalt, basically. Yeah. So um, that's important because if your heroes end up clumping as they um, get casted on, then you're more likely to get more value from your heroes despite how much farm you have. So yeah. the most simple um, example of that is Magnus, if you want to play clip number six. Clip um, number six. Magnus yeah. groups them which allows his second skill and power to allow melee heroes to to do more damage. So Magna, uh, just keep an eye on the Rubik, basically. He stole the RP. This is not a Magnus clip, this is a Rubik clip. And at some point it, it right. causes uh, five clumped heroes, and then the Omni Slash from the drug does more damage. And it just looks insane, right? It looks like the Dire what? Team is like, has eight more, eight times more farm, right? It looked, it looked like an accident happened. It looked like some sort of bug. Oh! I don't, I don't even know if he has it in power, to be honest. I don't even think he did have Empower. So that's without Empower. But Omni Slash just shredded through them. He had uh, Maelstrom at least, maybe Mjolnir, which is kind of an AoE skill as well. And ultimately, it just gives them a really good team fight. That's, that's the, the value of clumping, basically. Because anything that does AoE damage will do insanely more damage, up to five times more damage when heroes are clumped. It's that simple. So um, this is important because of how the map is designed, basically. Uh, it's one of the hardest things about actually yeah. going high ground. Um, you want to play Clip 7, then? Yes, yes I do. I'm so into this shit right now. And the same thing applies to stuns, by the way. If Even if you're a line and you have a line stun, if they line up, that's a Ravage. Every time. 12 second cooldown Ravage, like, it's amazing, right? So if you take a look at the, the color zones, you want to pause it here really quick. Um, you can kind of see the advantages that each side has. On the dire side or the red side, that's basically the places that they can stand if they want to. It's a giant open area, that means it's easier for them to uh, we call it Delta Split in Dota, which basically means like you just scatter like rats or something. Like If things are hitting the fan or you know you're about to get RP'd, you can spread out easily. But if you're on the enemy side sieging, 
you have to walk up this little ramp. And the ramps used to be smaller. There was a period in time when like it was like four hero units across. It was so tiny that almost every time you walk up high ground, you're clumped, which gives them advantage, which makes it hard to yeah. act actually in the game. So the, the weakness of going high ground is mostly on the ramp. You have to cross the ramp to even get to the enemy side. And when you do that, you're clumped. And then the next issue is if you actually go past the ramp, there's only one way out. You have to go back through the ramp. So in all that little yellow area in the dire base, let's say you blink past to initiate on a hero there. Well, if you're going to escape, there's only one way you can go, which means that heroes trying to cut you off have an easier path to land AOEs, to know where you're going to walk. They'll just drop it right on the, the ramp because that's ultimately where, where the escape paths are. Yeah. So the, the grouping of the ramp is a huge aspect of going high ground. And you have to be aware of this because if you're not, then it's going to lead to problems that lose you games more often. So now we'll kind of talk about how players play around that to ensure that it doesn't right. happen as often. Um, uh, you can continue the clip. Um, the other one is, uh, I believe, the escape lines. Um, it's very yeah, straightforward. Yeah, yeah. Like I pointed out, dire heroes can run lots of different ways. There's shrines all over the place. Pretty much any way that they run is going to be okay. Um, the other cool part, if you want to pause it right here, these are all basically tree clumps or high ground places where you can't walk unless you have flying movement. So things like Bat Rider, Heroes with Blink Daggers, Four Steps, these are the parts of the map that you can abuse as those heroes to try to beat the heroes that don't have those advantages. So one of the, yeah. one, a really old prevailing strategy is pick Bat Rider, you get a Blink Dagger, and when you're going high ground, you just blink past, grab somebody, and you pull them down the cliff because now they have that same issue. They have to walk all the way to the ramp. So there's yeah, lots yeah. of different ways to actually end games and abuse these maps. Um, initiating heroes will stand by trees near the cliffs or stand by the cliffs like uh, Universe yeah. did in that one clip. But you have to make sure your opponents don't see you and that you're able to abuse it to actually go high ground. So you have to be super aware of those areas. When you're going up the ramp, you can't see up the cliff. You basically have to make sure you don't have five heroes there ready to get AoE. Depends on the heroes. If there's an Axe, a Magnus, got to be really careful. Sick. So um, any other defensive advantages would be uh, can't see due to the tower vision because um, you can't see uphill. Um, they can see farther than you can because you, you're going to attack their tower, which means their tower yeah. can see you, whereas you don't know where they are because they're sitting behind waiting to initiate. So pushing There's high ground at night time is hard. Yeah. yeah, yep. You can't attack uphill as reliably. It's 25% miss, I believe. Um, do you want to play clip number eight? I actually don't know what this is, but I'm I'm believing in the... Okay, it was the wrong word. Um, so basically, you can't actually attack a tower high ground unless you have vision of it. And one way to do that is if the tower directly attacks you. If something attacks yeah. you, it creates a vision circle. So if the tower attacks you, that's one way to do it. Obviously, Sniper can also solve this problem by casting a shrapnel, walking high ground, letting the tower attack him. All of those things are yeah, yeah. different ways to make it easy, basically, where he just sits back and hits the tower until it dies. Because that's ultimately what you want to do. And uh, keep in mind, the Dragon Lance is actually a very new item in Dota. There was not... It's it's probably less than a year and a half, two years old, where you could increase your yeah, range crazy outside of tower. Me when you said that, like, because I knew that Aether Lens was relatively new as well, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's around the same timeline. But you, there weren't any heroes other than Sniper, I believe, that could actually outrange a tower. I think he was the only one um, for a very long time. So there was no hero that could just easily kill a tower, which means that um, every team that actually wants to end the game or go high ground, they have to win a team fight or they have to be in a dangerous position. Because if you're up in melee range attacking a tier three tower. It's it's like the uh, the five range the five marines example. You basically yeah, yeah. have like one marine in, or one zealot in the front hitting the tower, and their five marines are ready to attack the zealot, and you've got four marines behind the zealot. Ultimately, it's okay because the zealot has more HP and stuff, but it's very very dangerous for sure because it's there within cast range. They can force staff that guy. They can skewer him back. All of those big worries. Yeah, yeah. Are things that you have to consider. Um, I think we have. Uh, there's another one. Clip number nine. Um, there's also shrines outside of the base. This is a new thing. In the past, basically, if you'd go high ground and things went bad, you would lose a hero. You'd be like, oh, shoot, we lost a hero. Okay, guys, let's back up and go go back to farming until our hero's alive, and then we'll go do this again. In this yeah. example, the uh, OD gets a kill, and because of that, the raiding team is going to back up. So they're like, oh, shit, we lost a guy. Let's, let's run away. But now he can actually TP to the back line. Basically, another thing, making high ground pushing harder. There's some thought in Dota right now that's too hard to go high ground. Um, but there was a period of time, um, notably TI4 finals, they were like 20 minute games because uh, the, the one team would get an advantage and they knew exactly how to have the perfect advantage and they were just unstoppable once they got ahead. So it yeah, made yeah. like the TI4 finals really, really boring, unfortunately. Um, so things like shrines um, help offset that a little bit. So we'll just continue to go over all the extremely strong ways and difficult ways it, t it is to uh, take a high ground. Yeah. Uh, okay, so actual hero positioning, hitting the tower safely. You got any ways? Oh, 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 I, I almost played a clip. You want me to talk to you about the carry hitting the tower, Kevin? 
Yeah. Well, what do you got from watching your games? I, I know you've watched a couple of pro games, just a few. So what 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 is the most common way that you've seen carry safely hit buildings right now? Safely hit the lanes, or you mean like uh, safely hit buildings? Um, in truth, it's like I don't have anything good. I have. Will you wait for the creep line okay. to move up to give vision, and then you whack a tower a little bit? That's what you I got, got it. You're ready. <laughs> I'm ready. I understand everything. I mean, okay. there's that. There's um. I've seen other derpy things in pub games where like Carrie buys a blade mail and activates blade mail and runs up to the tower with creep wave just to make sure that if someone casts a spell it deals damage back. But I look at that and I'm like, that's fucking bad. Um, yeah. the, the other real basic one is illusions. Make an illusion. Tell the illusions. Go to the thing. Lose the illusions. No big deal. Make that's been illusions. pretty nerfed though. Um, illusions do very little damage to towers. They used to do a lot more. I think it, they do something like 50%, 25% of what they used to. Um, yeah. They don't do full damage towers. It's extra reduced because it was it was definitely the way to hit buildings. I think that's part of the reason Dragonlance got put in because it was like illusions is by far the best way to hit towers. Why would we just not pick illusion heroes? And now they're like, okay, well, we'll give ranged heroes a way to actually hit towers a little bit more safely if you're not snipers. So Dragonlance comes in, and that's basically the best way to hit buildings right now by pro players is uh, CGing with Dragonlance. Clip number wow. ten, sir. Dude, yeah, let's go. Ranged so, carry. Ranged same clip. Carry. I want you to pause here and just kind of take a look at how OG is sieging this. And just kind of look at their hero positioning. So you put the guy hitting the tower who's strong, hard to kill, does the most tower damage right in the front. He's hitting the building. So he's like the, the most person in threat because he's closest to the enemy team. And then, like you said, you put the support staff immediately around him, but not too clumped up. Um, in yeah. fact, I think the start of this clip, um, they are running from the mid lane maybe, but do you see where Legion Commander is as well? Yeah, they're, yeah. they're running from the mid lane, so they're slightly out of position. But um, ultimately, it's uh, carry hitting the building, support staff surrounding him. Um, they'll put the Ember in the front so that he can actually try to initiate on heroes to prevent yeah. their blink daggers, for example. And everybody's grouped enough that even if the RP comes in, it's never going to hit more than two heroes. And if it and does hit also somebody... also the illusions spread out to give vision and, and, and pushing forward. And to limit AoE. Because if you clump them together, EG throws a couple AoEs down and all the illusions die. And then you've got to resummon them all. So spreading those out is a huge aspect as well. The vision is, is a big part of it, though. So lots of heroes that can do this. Terrorblade, Draw Ranger, Shadow Fiend, Sniper. Basically any ranged hero that does a lot of physical damage that can buy Dragonlance will usually do this. Because it makes them safe to hit buildings and safely, hopefully, kill the tower and the racks. Because ultimately, EG is just waiting for them to get out of position. Because if they get out of position, EG initiates, they get an RP, they do a sonic wave, they they do all their combos, everybody dies, ideally. But if OG just positions well enough, then EG won't have that opportunity to initiate. Another easy way that you can do this is abusing things like Rage or Jug Spin, clip 11 for that. All right. Here this is go. from DAC, I believe. Um, where the life stealer walks forward, he uses rage to go magic immune, and he hits the tower, and then starts running away when rage is about to run out. So um, you can kind of see how liquid starts reacting to this. Uh, I believe it's this clip. Uh, yep, same same game. So what they start doing because they kept doing this repeatedly is the axe would call, blink in berserker's call, which um, taunts through BKB, and then yeah. he would run the life stealer away. That way he would be out of position a little bit longer, and he would be far away from the tower. And you kind of have to start, you like and. The pro scene is always going to develop like safe ways to do stuff like this. Like, yeah. oh, I'm just going to walk forward and slowly chip the tower until the tower dies and ensure that our team is never out of position. That way we get the barracks, get the advantage, and therefore I have a higher chance of winning the game. Very common thing. Um, so there's lots of little abusive things like this you can do. Uh, the third clip that we showed actually was uh, Liquid finding another way to initiate. Because obviously trying to go through the life stealer is really tough. He's got Aegis. He's using yeah. Rage repeatedly. What they ended up doing instead in the third clip is they hit the sideline, um, which is like wraparound heroes with a smoke and try to hit the squishy supports, because those are the guys that they're trying to kill, right? The the Lena on the back lane, who does a lot of damage, or the uh, Magnus, who wants to initiate, or the Earth Spirit. Any of those three would be the ideal. Oh, I see. Okay, so what's happening here is that they're just circumventing this guy by going into the yep. back area? Yep, because if they try to kill the Life Stealer, he's the tankiest. He's got Aegis, he's got Rage. Which is very difficult to take a good team fight. So instead, what they do is they go for the back line, which gives them a slightly higher chance to win the fight. So this would be the example of um, 
you're playing against five zealots, five marines, and you have the same, but your zealots teleport to the back line and kill the marines first while your marines are defended, you know? Sit the that marines sounds in the back. so unfair, dude. Zealots yeah. with blink, man. <laughs> Just blink yeah. onto tanks. <laughs> Basically, like, you, you want to hit oh. the back line, which balance-wise are usually the higher damage dealers sometimes, but also the lower HP. Kill those guys first to make the tanky guy easier to kill. The 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 Aegis Sniper one v one one v five example, same thing. <laughs> kill the kill the backline. Kill the supports that are gonna actually respond. Um, is is the best thing to do. Uh, clip number twelve. If you wanna fly right into that one. Yeah. So um, this is a good example of Aegis being valuable. Invoker so... is in the front. He's got Aegis. They basically initiate, which kills their initiation advantage, but the Invoker stays alive which means that they uh, certainly lost their initiation advantage, and now the fight gets hard as a result. And so what we might say is that even if Invoker died, that's still overall a relatively positive thing, because it was hard for the Invoker to die. Yeah, and, and... they've wasted all their initiation on him. Exactly. Whether that is spells, or strong abilities, or um, teamfight ultimates, like, it, it, it prevents you... Imagine, like, if you go on the Life Stealer and you blow Flaming Lasso, Ravage, Sonic yeah. Wave, and it's just on him, and he respawns with Aegis, and obviously you lose the follow-up fight. There's no way that you can win after that. So, um, it's the the big advantage that um, that Aegis gives you when going high ground. Those are the, the those are the basic ways to go high ground. Huh. All right, and um, defensive hero positioning. A couple more here. All right, here we go. Boom. So. So the uh, OG was in a pretty safe spot, right? So the easiest way for them to get an advantage against Terrorblade is to push him out of position. Yeah. Because that forces all of the backline of OG to move forward. They have to follow him to stay within cast range to cast their defensive abilities. S4, for example, uses press the attack to remove stuns. Because if they throw a stun on No-Tail and he uses press the attack, the stun's gone, and then No-Tail can take a fight. Basically counteracts what EG actually does in their team yeah. fights. So if they screw him back, it's harder for them to react. It didn't actually work. But it was it was a good try, basically. Every player is going to want to do stuff like that. So here's SG looking for initiation. It's very tough because there's a tree in the back lane. There's a Legion commander. There's a, a Dazzle as well. If they don't grab the right hero, the person will be graved. Uh, press the attacked. The duel will go on the back line. Things like that. Damn. So EG, EG just wants us in the front with the hero that's unlikely to die, that SG is not going to want to go on to. That's the Spectre. He sits in the front. The Batrider does the smart thing by grabbing the Legion, because if he lassos anybody else, the Legion would press the attack on whoever got lassoed. And that allows EG to take a pretty good fight. It was a good initiation by SG, but I think they were too far behind in this game. I don't remember Damn. which game of this. This might have, it looks like this was game three, perhaps. Could be. Maybe yes, maybe no. No one knows. But it, it's, it's basically all about the position. Get the supports in the back. Force them to go on the guy with the Aegis. Try to kill the supports if possible. Huh. And that gives you a better chance to actually go high ground. And then ultimately, boom, they get two kills. They only had one death, and now they can hit the barracks. Safely. Whereas at the start of that, their positioning was, like, so specific, right? Yeah, Carrying I, I the front. rewatch the start of this SG EG clip again. And slow it down so I can fully appreciate the moves. Last one on the back line. Which was right when Legion would have casted the debuff on the Spectre. Yeah. And as the supports are catching up, the Rock hits the back line, which is really well done by SG. Clockwork gets there to interrupt EG heroes from chasing farther. But ultimately, I don't think it mattered that much because EG was able to hit the back line using Haunt. The Puck blink forward, uh, the Tree blink uh, forward. So I think, I think I'm starting to be able to understand this where there's it's really that there's this super basic groundwork which is carries with long range want to whack at towers or the safe the safe heroes is maybe the better yeah. way to say it. yes we'll say the safe hero wants to whack at the towers and then the enemy team will use whatever set of abilities they have to exploit that such as skewer yep. to bring him back or some sort of stun to initiate on him because he's the farthest one forward Yep, to take an and, initiation advantage or other reasons. And, th and then all the complexity and judgment comes from understanding what 
are the tools you have to exploit those really basic things and then yep. what tools they have to respond to what you're trying to exploit yep and then you're just thinking three chess moves ahead if i stun this guy he'll use press the attack so i have to stun the legion instead otherwise it will be instantly countered he'll counter my ultimate with his basic Man. ability for some reason i was like i i always expect things to be very complex but i mean it's it's like quite basic it's like get an aegis get vision pick people off at the sides yeah use your safe hero to chip at the tower <laughs> it's <laughs> simple but the it's it's a res what you should respect about it is the discipline of how they do that that like when you when you play a pub game you're like hey we just got a kill let's go high ground and every hero on your team walks up to the tower and they just start slapping the tower so then everybody on the enemy team can see all five of your heroes yeah they're all grouped up they see exactly where they are which gives them even even easier options for the bat rider to actually blink last so the right guy for example it just makes makes the the actual team fight that might happen simpler. So when you're playing, when you're going high ground, you have to play it safe. Ideally, that way you minimize oh. the chances of them actually winning a fight when they shouldn't, because they have all those other defensive advantages. That's basically what you're trying to exploit. Yeah, yeah. Well, what it means is that like the the core is so basic, and all the stuff on top is what's crazy complicated and has all this consideration. But like, yeah. it's so funny to me how simple the framework is. You know, it's kind of like in in StarCraft. Everything is about having more total resources. That's mm -hmm. that's the number that matters. So if you do an early attack to try to deal damage, you can always say if it was good or bad by saying how much resources did it cost you, how much resources did you lose, and how many resources did you kill. Done. That's, that's literally the whole equation, and it's complex to be able to judge what the right units are to build to maximize and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, it's just the money, you know, that's going on mm -hmm. here. And here it's the same thing where it's like, you know, it's... You want your safe guy whacking at the tower, and you want to make sure that you avoid what would prevent you from doing that. And there's a shitload of nuance and subtlety there, but the basic mm -hmm. idea is very basic. So, yeah. Um, ah! Clip number fourteen. If you want to play that next, it's, uh, it's one of the other roles that you're doing when you're going high ground. Yeah. Go this is uh, the it's a VP versus OG game. Um, this is the role of Sand King. Uh -huh. So look at it from his perspective. He's staying so what he's, real far back. What his goal basically is to find when his opponents are out of position and disable them when when that's the case and to not die, because pretty much every eleven seconds he wants to burrow strike the enemies. So if he gets a burrow strike on them, it lets them set up and guarantee kills. So here he is, staying back, staying back, looking for a burrow strike, ping in there, he, saying, "Am I going this guy?" He got hit by radiance, so so that's why he couldn't. And he's basically playing the role that Magnus played in the first clip that we saw. Waiting for the right opportunity. He did miss that one, Holy but it's okay. Shit. That guy died right away. And that was Magnus yeah. finding that one. And he uses his burrow strike, and then he gets back out again, because he's got to wait for his blink to come off cooldown again. Holy fuck, this is so clear. Oh my god. Now he sees an opportunity, he goes for it. He's going to get the spectre kill, help with the bat rider getting low. Then he was worried about the TA, so he runs away from the tier 4s, so that they don't have vision of him anymore. And then same thing goes back in again. Tries to hit two oh man with that. Oh my god! Misses. This is the most incredibly informative clip. I gotta watch this whole shit again, man. Holy mother, mother, motherfucker, Kevin! This is you wanna, amazing. You want to see something really cool? Is look at the buffs that are on Sanking at the start here. See that orb of venom? He's yeah. taking radiance damage. But the reason that Arteezy bought an Orb of Venom in this game is because the illusions do apply it, which means that for three seconds after the illusion is dead, you can't use a blink dagger. So he did that because he's against a Magnus and a Sand King. Because those two heroes need to use Blink. So now he knows that instead of Haunt disabling Blink for 8 seconds, or 6 seconds or whatever it is, 8 seconds while Radiance is active, it actually works for like 11 seconds. So it gives, it gives, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't Arteezy, it was uh, uh, No Tail, I believe. But it gives them basically like 11 seconds where their opponents can't actually initiate. Oh. That's why Sand King hasn't done anything up until this point. Because as soon as Haunt happens, he's taking Radiance damage and can't initiate. So OG can try to abuse that as a prevent your opponents from going in, try to win a team fight right there. Oh kind of my cool, gosh, and that... Cool aspect. Oh shit, that gives a whole different value to Radiance that I did not think about, which is yep. like, it's what makes um, pursuing so much easier, because mm -hmm. they're just taking Radiance damage, they can't blink. Yep, and they can't initiate, therefore, so even if you clump up, it doesn't matter at that point, because you know that they can't blink and cast an RP on you. You know what item is godly for that? Is Urn. 
Yes. So if if you know that if you know that you're going high ground and the Magnus is gonna try to RP you or the axes, if you cast Urn on him and it ticks for the first tick, you know you're good for eight seconds or eleven seconds or whatever it is. Like I just can't blink for ten seconds. So hitting good do, golly goddamn having that impact just means like oh we have ten seconds we don't have to worry about our positioning due to this hero, because we know he can't actually blink anymore. All of that stuff really impacts team fight clips as well. Did you need the solo on that one? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, yeah, that was good. It was also a misclick, but it was good. It was the okay. best misclick. All right. Oh my god. We got we got two two drill clips where I want you to tell me where the people should be. Okay. You can do that. It's pro game, so it's gonna be a little hard. All right. So we have Timber Saw here. We have uh, Mr. Mr. Centaur, Centaur War Runner. We have is that Dazzle? Troll. Really? That's oh yeah, that's Troll Warlord. It literally says it right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm not quite used to being this far away, uh, and I I see absolutely no one else anywhere else. So three to the left, as to the left. Wait, where? Uh, in the mid lane. Just look at the map. Oh yeah, of course. Okay, so in this particular position, I guess that the character that would be the good chipper do would be Troll with um, his axes. I and because he has BKB as well yeah. as the other big thing. I, well, actually, I feel like, is it reasonable for him to run up with BKB and to whack on this because he just deals so much damage to towers? No, because if your opponents have Glyph, and you pop BKB to hit a building and they Glyph, then you've lost your BKB now. It's absolutely not worth it. The only time you want to do that is if you know they don't have Glyph, and you're going to be able to kill it during the BKB duration and run out in time, similar to what Lifestealer was doing earlier. It is sometimes a strategy, but it's more of a, we're going to kill this and get out kind of a thing. So it's a rare thing, but it does happen sometimes. Okay, Ultim so... Oh, he doesn't, he doesn't want to use BKB until he knows that his opponents are committing, or if he knows he's in a bad spot and it's going to die if he doesn't pop it, is how he's going to want to do it. Or if he needs to, if he sees Warlock by himself and he's like, I'm just going to kill this Warlock, and the only way to do that is to BKB so he doesn't get banished or something. Yeah, yeah. Then that would be his option. Okay, so where do you, where, where so... Do you think, it, ideally, where do you think this should be positioned? You can draw on the screen with your mouse or whatever. Yeah, so, um, you know, Centaur, I think it's fine to be somewhere over here to the left. Just what the reason? usual, uh, the blink stomp initiate in case someone's at a, at a position or someone begins to go on troll, being able to pop in and stomp to support troll. Timbersaw, I'm not too certain on, but I would assume a little ways back, but not super far back. I think it's reasonably okay for him to show. The reason being that um, the only good tree hook targets would be these ones on the side and... If someone comes up, you just deal a shitload of damage to him, but Timbersaw really can't do anything to the towers because he's like all magic. I would say Timber can be aggressive up there because he can clear creep waves really fast. So even if you can't do a lot of tower damage, killing the creep wave is good because then your creeps hit their tower. Oh, okay. So that's an option. And he's ultra tanky. Um, there are some vulnerabilities against like Enchant and OD, but yeah. I think ultimately he was going to be fine there. Um, all right, what about the other heroes? Okay, so... Tree and Dazzle. Dazzle, whenever Dazzle gets here, should, I think, just be very far away from this entire ridge so he does not get Blunk upon, but yeah. somewhere in the back so he can shallow grave whoever needs be. Now, how, would you, uh, how, how, how far away exactly? Would you stand exactly within cast range of shallow grave? Uh, well, I don't know what the items are of Dazzle, but I would say just a little bit back. Let's say he has, like, Solar Crest, Arcane Boots, Wand, or something. I guess so right you, where my mouse is, right here. Right there? L okay. Right there. Okay. What if right. the troll is hitting the tower? Would you still put Dazzle in that position? It's like, what are you worried about as Dazzle? Is my question, basically. Uh, there's two things that I'd be worried about. I would be worried about someone darting in on me, particularly Legion Commander. Um, okay, but to do that, they have to be able to see you, right? Yeah. So if, oh, so right if you know here. they don't have vision, nice. yeah. You could hide behind a tree. That way they don't know where you are. I know they want to go on you, but if they don't know where you are, then they can't. Or they have to guess. And if they misguess, then they're screwed probably because then they're just out of position, right? Yeah. So it's vision-based. It's semi-within range that you know that I you see. could probably get to them and grave them in time before they die to burst. But if they have more burst, maybe you need to be within range no matter what. If you have a blink dagger yourself as a dazzle, then you can be within cast range and blink dagger range. Added it's like together. 2000 or whatever. If you have more movement speed, you can react faster as a support because movement speed is in some ways a blink dagger. You get from one point to another to get in range. If you have more cast range, you can stand farther back. 
all those aspects on a support are actually really important because it does let you hide better or sit farther back when you go high ground. And you should never be hitting the building as a dazzle or a tree ever. Or, or as a crystal maiden. When or as a crystal maiden. When you are the farthest ground. forward person, you've whacked once for 29 damage, and you're like, listen, there's no creep wave or any allies, but let me hit it just one more time. Or vision. So that tower I'm going to let the tower. I'll let the tower attack me. That way I can see it and get one more attack in. Yeah. <laughs> That's another option. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, really dangerous so to do that. Good. If you're ever playing against the Storm Spirit, um, the best way to play against him is hide in the trees nearby where your team's pushing. That way he doesn't really know where you are exactly. If you're against the Slark, put a sentry down slightly outside oh. tower range, protecting the area where you're going to be hanging out. And make sure oh, that god, he doesn't hit, so hit you from the back line where your sentry isn't. Oh my god. My god, Kevin! The experience of the last three weeks of playing Dota and attending these lessons is kind of like all I've been doing up to this point is learning vocabulary in a foreign language, and now okay. sentences are finally fucking happening. It like it makes so much sense, because it, it used to be sentry wards can see invisible things. Slark yeah. sometimes is invisible. You can buy sentries against him. It's also supports job to buy sentries. Pushing high ground is important. Here are some techniques, and now you just strung them all together. Where you're like, well, the support doesn't want to get gone on, so he's gonna go ahead and put the center here against the slark in this sort of position, so he can still accomplish the goal of shallow grave, which is all lying at the top. The basic goal of having the troll hit the goddamn tower, Kevin. Oh, yeah. oh, fucking brain shit happening right now. Good. Jesus. All right, we got we got one more of those. All right. Oh wait. Did, one, oh. one more uh, clip. Yeah, it's okay. The rest of the one, uh, you you could keep watching this. Honestly, there's a la, lot of there's a lot la, of parts. La, 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 la. It, it oh, auto pauses. The freeze. It, it, auto, it auto pauses a few times to if you want to yeah. rethink. Like, hey, is this safe? Look what look how trolls doing this as well. He's actually doing it in ranged mode, rather yeah. than melee. Do you know why he's doing that? Uh, so that he can be farther back, so he doesn't get so he doesn't get yep. gone on, man. Exactly. Boom. Holy, holy, fucking holy. Okay, dude, dude, I'm re I'm ready for the next one. This is. All right, yeah, this so is SG versus EG, I believe game three. Go EG. Okay, so it is, it's analyze time, right? Say what's going yep. good and bad. First of all, that portrait does not look a thing like Juggernaut. It's I thought Juggernaut they introduced, Arcana. I thought they introduced a new hero into the game when I first saw this. I was like, yeah. what, what is this weird blob face? I thought it was like an underlord, but apparently that's, that's Juggernaut. So uh, with this lineup, um, the Juggernaut, I think, is semi-okay to push forward, purely because of Whirlwind. That's the main reason why. Mm -hmm. um, but Lena is also another good one to, to be whacking away with, especially with the range upgrade. Uh, and so, where should the other characters be? I mean, Clockwork can be way the hell back. Um, Would you um, just put him behind your team? Let me think for a moment. Let me think about the other one. So Warlock, I would definitely just put, you know, behind the trees here or in the trees there. Yeah. Um, Bat Rider. Um, wouldn't surprise me if he had four staff and blink. So that means you can actually, like, stay way the hell far back and just look for pickoffs. Clockwork, I'm actually not very sure where to position. I mean, I know his ult is so insane. But... Do you know how it works? Okay, here's my understanding of how it works. I don't know if it's a individual character target or whether it is a, a skill place shot. upon ground skill shot okay but it extends for a range of like 2500 at level three and yeah. then it causes it causes clockwork to be like fucking a dragon ball z character coming in out of nowhere streaks of lightning behind him yeah. he crashes into the enemy and unlike in dragon ball z he summons cogs yeah they don't i don't think they i mean i haven't watched every episode but yeah um, he, if he hits anything on the way, though, he, he hooks to them. So you actually don't want to be behind your allies in this case because it's impossible to hook through the creeps, through the heroes. Ah, realization. That makes so much sense. So where you would want to be as clock is actually towards the north a little bit. That way you have an angle of actually hitting the enemies and depth of it. And it's only units and heroes. It's not like trees. Nope, no trees, buildings, anything like that. What about Just careers? heroes and heroes. Do you hookshot a courier? I actually don't know if you can hookshot a courier. I would guess Sick. no, but maybe... It might work, honestly, because it hits BKB units, I think. It's done some as well. I'm not sure, though. Um, Bat Rider, you're slightly off on that. You don't want to sit in the back and react. You're an initiation hero. You can counter-initiate, kind of, but what he wants to do is probably play around trees. If you think about the graphic we showed earlier, he wants yeah. to actually firefly to the south, fly over the trees where his opponents can't see over the trees, and then Ooh, using here. vision, yeah, down there, 
basically fly over there, let his allies go high ground to spot opponents, then he blinks, lassos, and force pulls somebody out of position, basically. Oh. Would be his ideal. Or Clockwork can do the same from the north, would be your options. And then the Lena and the Warlock sit in the back, pretty much. Or maybe Lena, Lena hits in the back. Them. Yeah, okay. Cool. I think she's the mid this game actually, so it's probably worth it for her to like jug melee melee range hitting the building, and Lena behind. So, thoughts right now. This clockwork is in a very dangerous position because, especially given the time, there's going to be our creep wave pushing. There's going to be their creep wave spawning. Uh, it seems like it would be very hard because it's essentially this tiny angle right here. So this yeah. very very bad clockwork. I would say oh, bat rider. It's kind of bad. What'd you say? Yeah, I would say his positioning's a little bad. Okay. Um, this, oh my god, I can't believe this Bat Rider is so far back. This Warlock is doing a good job staying on a staircase. Okay. Which is kind of the equivalent of being behind trees, so. Alright. Three, two, one. And now look how the fight starts. This fight is happening too quickly for me to process. Alright, we're gonna slow yeah. it down. All right, first thing I want you to look at, uh, tell me what the Bat Rider does in this fight. All right. Uh, gets haunted and can't blink. Slowly makes his way forward. Casted Flame Break, don't discount his help. Wow. Relatively little. Yep, basically did nothing. Finally lassoed somebody. It was, it was good. Huh. And it's not because the guy's a bad player. It's because the jug was too far forward. Like, SG actually still won that fight, but it's kind of insane to me that they did. It, it pretty much just happened because, I don't know, shit happens. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was Jug Healing Ward. Maybe it was the uh, the Golem reaction. But Batrider did almost nothing to help that, to that uh, for that team fight to win in their favor. And I think Clockwork just bolted right in on that duel. It's if possible. I recall yeah. correctly. Well, I don't even need to recall. I can just I can just look. Mm -hmm. now. Yeah, let's see what he does. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh. Oh, he stunned at the start, and then he walked in. It looks like the Jug actually was killing the Legion. Was what was happening? So Legion got really low, I believe. Yeah, Legion got Shallow Grave and then picked off, okay. and then here's Clockwork trying to do some action, but it looks like Clockwork still has not... There's the ult. Yeah, used it right at the end. So basically it looked like the duel was a little weak, actually. They didn't really have enough damage to kill the Jug, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Jug just kind of killed everybody regardless. And the Golem and the Fatal Bonds helped them blow up the back line, because they all linked damage, pretty much. So it looked actually quite good for EG, like SG was definitely out of position. Jug was way too far ahead, but apparently it didn't matter. So maybe he did it on purpose, who wow. knows? You'd have to ask the guy. So in that moment, EG thought that they made a good decision, but it turns out it was actually weak. Who knew? Holy guacamole. And they overdive again, more heroes die, and then it looks like, hey, yes, she's gonna beat EG all of a sudden. Yeah, dude, this series was so exciting to watch. Dude, the five-man dream coil from Sumail was so ridiculous. Yeah, and that, that's an example of SG just having worse discipline, basically. They did dangerous things. And let's look at their positioning now. How do you how do you feel about their positioning? Um, okay, this is... These two heroes are more or less fine. Bat Rider should be probably much closer to the wall here. That could work, because you can hide behind the trees. should be much farther back here. Okay. Because, yeah, there is a puck. Well, I mean, this is close enough. Warlock's, I guess, mostly fine, but maybe should be behind trees or some some such nonsense. Mm -hmm. Alright, better play. My thoughts. Three, two, one. Dyer's top tower is under attack. Radiant's oh, there it is! There's the Warlock dying to the puck! Oh! And he killed the Healing Ward, which would have kept these guys full HP most likely. Holy shit. Alright, so at this point in time, I think that this positioning is, I guess, fine. Yeah, I would say so. But they use Glyph. And they Dream Coil the Jug. And now Jug dies. And it goes from looking like a 2 racks to 
e.g. buying enough time to actually stay alive. So somehow they were able to defend that 2v4. I think it's largely because the Warlock was out of mana, actually. He didn't have any mana for Shadow Ward, so he couldn't keep himself alive because that last fight was so chaotic. Yeah. Um, whereas if he has more mana, he can heal himself <laughs> to full. As she gets a two racks right there, maybe oh they win the God. game. But definitely positioning. The Puck was able to land his combo on two heroes, I believe. Silence multiples, ultimately killing the Warlock, killing the Healing Ward. Just like everything was perfect. And if Universe doesn't, doesn't do that, there's a better chance that SG wins just from getting more and more lane advantage. And then maybe because they, if they got a two racks, all the lanes are pushing all the time and EG doesn't even get to defend Roche all the times that they did. You know, might have might have happened that way. So like uh, high ground discipline basically is extremely important. And the places that you stand and how you think about how your opponents are going to initiate is, is really crucial. It really affects whether or not you win more games or not. All right. So do that perfectly. Or at least think about it. I mean, there's it's not super actionable. Yeah, I... I can't be like, go play a game. And five, go get the ages and five man high ground with your team and stand in perfect positionings. Like, you're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to be able to tell your allies where to stand. But as as those high ground situations happen, and if you lose those fights or if you win a fight against opponents, I want you to think about why it happened. Were they out of position? Did you take an initiation advantage? Was your AoE too effective? Right. Were your spells just used better than theirs? Like, try to think about why those engagements happen, and then we can cover that. Um, when we do the game review. Okay, cool. I think um, I, I want to play Lena and Crystal Maiden today for two reasons. Okay. One, I really fucking like playing those heroes. And two, I'm familiar enough with each of them now that I feel like I can think through and process that stuff. They're two different roles of participating in this, but that's that's my plan. Okay, sounds time. good. And then I will continue to attempt to learn Slark, you monster. Are you gonna you're gonna play Slark Game Three? Okay. <laughs> Uh, probably not going to play Slark Game 3 because I'm I'm sufficiently unfamiliar with how to just do basic shit with him that I just want to play more games with him before I yeah, that's fair. waste viewers' time with me being a shitty, fishy guy. But uh, you did still have, like, top four net worth, which was still important. Course. You, you got to have those games where you die 19 times and get one kill, and then you're like, hey, I was actually still pretty farmed because my opponent suck at farming, and I did, good, I and I did a good crazy. job farming. That's so you the did craziest that. thing to me, yeah. So yeah. Um, dude, I'm I am stupidly excited to break high grounds now, because normally what I do is go, all right, well guys, we don't have an Aegis. The Aegis is down, which means we are impotent for eight <laughs> minutes at least. And everyone's like, okay, right, right away. Let's go to the jungle. Let's get shrines. Ah, oh, we're fucking smart now. Um, well, tight. Or you could just kill your opponents outside their base and then ignore this whole episode. That works too. Ah. Uh, if you want to. But, uh, yeah, dude, I, I'm loving Lena so much, man. Oh, my God, Lena's so awesome. Ah! Um, either way, guys, what's going to happen now is I'm going to go play approximately three games of Dota, unless they go way long or way short, but it's going to be about three games, a mixture of Lena and Crystal Maiden. After that, Purge is going to take clips of the games and do a review show of those, and then Purge is going to do a live coaching session, and there is a 1 out of 11 chance that Purge is accidentally a player and plays alongside me. Because historically, that is our probability that we're working with. Um, extra special thanks to... Oh my god, I accidentally unplugged my audio. Okay, I can hear you now. If you said anything, totally didn't. I didn't say anything. Go ahead. Wait, what can... the hell? Where... Oh god, no. I said something. Electricity. Ah! Okay, we're back. Kevin, I'm back. Okay, what happened? Um, I just kicked the power cord out on my speakers. It's like okay. super, like, just bump it a little bit, and it's just like, yeah, no electricity. But anyways, uh, big thanks to the sponsor, Gamer Sensei. You can check them out at gamersensei.com. Uh, and there is a link below for a sign-up to their glorious service, which is coaching from top players in the games that you play. Um, so if you are, say, let's just pick a game at random here. If you're a Dota 2 player, let's just pick an MMR at random here, and you're stuck at 2K, there's plenty of players who are over 6, 7, and 8K um, well, over 6 and 7K, certainly, that I've seen yeah, on definitely. Gamer Sensei. Uh, and you can pay 10 to $25 an hour for a coaching session. And there is a sign-up link, once again, right below here with additional information to get a $10 off code. And uh, and uh, one person that signs up a week will get a hour of coaching with me as well. Ready done. One. Oh. I have my next one tomorrow. So I think we're a couple weeks behind. Sick. Yep. 
Well, tight. Uh, well, in that regard, I will now go off on to the glorious journey of playing the Dotas. I'm going Sounds to use good. a restroom, so we will be taking approximately three minute break for me to caffeinate, um, hydrate, and urinate. That, that worked really well, I think. It's a great closer. Solid. <laughs> Solid. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. 